Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance and UNICEF webinar to launch the new UNICEF res resource um, on disability inclusive child protection competency framework. We're just going to wait another one or two minutes. We have about 58 people on, on this call at the moment. Um, so we'll just wait one or two more minutes for people to join, if that's okay. Okay, for those who are just joining, we're just about to get going. Um, we, we've reached about 80 participants. I, I know that there were um, a good one or 200 people that were registered. So I think we might just wait another minute for people to join. Um, this is uh, Hugh Salmon. I'm the director of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. I'm joining you from a hotel room in Rio de Janeiro, um, hence my rather boring background. Uh, and I'll, I'll do the full introductions in a minute. Okay, I think, we've, I think we, we're good to go. We've got 80 people online. So it's great to have you all with us today. Um, as, as I was just saying, so welcome to the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance and UNICEF webinar to launch the new UNICEF resource, uh, which is called the Disability Inclusive Child Protection Framework for the Social Service Workforce or DIC for short. Just hold on one second, I'm very sorry. Okay, my apologies for that. Um, my colleagues in Rio de Janeiro are calling me at exactly the wrong time. Okay, so uh, just to go through the introductions before we get going. So this is, um, my name is Hugh Salmon. I'm the director of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. Um, joining me for, is, my, um, is the communications and advocacy manager in my team, Alina Sherman, from UNICEF headquarters, uh, child protection program team. We have Lucy Richardson, who's the Disability Inclusion in Child Protection Consultant, uh, Anuruddha Kulkarni, uh, Child Protection Specialist, and Kirsten DiMartino, uh, Senior Advisor on, on Child Protection, also in the, the HQ Child Protection Program team. Um, I see some of you are introducing yourselves to each other in the chat. Please continue to do so. Uh, it'd be great to see who's here today. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background um, about the why the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance is so delighted to be joining with UNICEF to launch this disability inclusive child protection competency framework for the social service workforce. For us, it's a, a wonderful opportunity because here we are um, 10 years in now since we launched in 2013. And in that time, we've brought together a, a diverse global membership, uh, building a strong social service workforce to adapt and respond to different needs and, and contexts. But as we really now look to the future, um, we need to have a greater focus on building wider sets of capacities for the social service to workforce to operate in, in quite complex and, and fast changing environments, but also reaching some of the marginalized or overlooked population groups. And that in particular is children with disabilities. Um, I think too often that they tend to be uh, left to one side or to separate teams. And we really want to be seeing how we all can have the competencies to include working with children and with disabilities and their families in our daily work. So it, we know that it can be challenging for social service workers to reach and successfully work with all population groups and community members, especially if they feel they don't have the full range of competencies to confidently do so. And that's why sometimes they say either, sorry, we can't work with you, or there's this separate team over there, you'll need to go to them. We're trying to avoid that and have a much more inclusive approach where there's no wrong door. You, social workers can at least some, start some work and then obviously bring in others where needed. So really our shared experience as UNICEF in the Alliance is showing that often the case, uh, children with disabilities and their families um, have requested you know, more support to meet the needs of these children. And we're now really trying to request uh, to, to respond to that, to that challenge. Um, so hence this competency framework. Um, 
which aims to address these challenges and, and fill the gaps in capacity and in confidence of the workforce. So it's a tool that outlines the competencies that the social service workers need to perform their activities in a, in a disability inclusive way. It makes disability inclusion easy to implement because workers are integrating disability inclusion activities into their existing activities. It's not about things being done separately, it's including it into the daily work of the social service workforce with all children and all families, um, regardless of the, the, the special needs, ability or disability of the children. So it's a resource for all social service workers, no matter the context, the country, the resourcing, the service type, the organization or the job description. So, so please bear that in mind, that it will be relevant for all your colleagues working with children and families. So just very briefly on the logistics for this call before I hand over to, to, to Lucy from UNICEF. So we'll be releasing the framework towards the end of Lucy's presentation. So please look for the link in the chat at that time. As I mentioned, feel free to continue to use the chat button to introduce yourself or send a message to the host if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, you can use the Q&A button. Please use only the Q&A button for your questions. Um, and you use that to submit your questions. And also if you um, want to endorse a question or you think that's an important one to be answered, please upvote your question. And, and you should be able to find a way to click on a question that you want to make sure gets answered. Um, we have automated closed captions enabled for this webinar. So please, if you'd like the captions, please select the icon at the bottom of your screen to turn them on. Uh, while we do not have translation available for this meeting, you may choose to have automated captions translated into the language of your choice. And to do that, you simply select your language via the closed caption button. And hopefully you can see that where it says CC at the bottom of your screen. Now this webinar is being recorded and will be made available via the Alliance website. Um, so just for those who joined late, I'm Hugh Salmon, Director of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. And I'm now delighted to hand the floor to, to Lucy Richardson, uh, from, who is Disability Inclusion in Child Protection Consultant with the UNICEF Headquarters Child Protection Program team. Over to you, Lucy. Great. Thank you so much, Hugh. I'm going to share um, the PowerPoint for this webinar now. And what if, um, Hugh or someone, could you confirm that you can see the uh, PowerPoint cover slide here? Yes. Wonderful. So yeah, so welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you for the excellent introduction here. So uh, I'll start with a with a brief introduction uh, to children with disabilities and disability inclusive child protection and to the social service workforce for child protection. And then we're going to get into the resource itself, covering the four uh, parts of the resource and then uh, how to use it and then time for discussion and questions. Uh, so as Hugh mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and uh, the PowerPoint will also be available. Um, I'll also be briefly describing the slide contents, uh, but because the PowerPoint will be available afterwards, you'll also have the opportunity to look more closely at it um, after the webinar. So First, I'd like to start with, you know, who are children with disabilities? Uh, using the definition from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we say that children with disabilities are those under 18 who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. And this text is on the slide here. And the, um, the text that's highlighted is impairments, barriers, and participation, because those are the key words in, in this definition here. It's, um, it's really about impairments interacting with barriers to, to hinder participation. And how many children with disabilities are there? That's something that we get asked um, quite a lot at UNICEF. And our most recent data on children with disabilities was released in our 2021 publication, Seen, Counted, Included. That's available on our website. And this slide shows um, a world map 
with regions in different colours indicating uh, the numbers of children with disabilities around the world and also percentages as, as a percentage um, of the children in that region. So it ranges from um, 8 million I, uh, children with disabilities in North America to 64.4 million in South Asia, um, from 6% in Europe and Central Asia to 15% in West and Central Africa. Globally, uh, we estimate 236.3 million children uh, have disabilities, which is around 10% of um, the, the global population of children. Our most recent data also explores the experiences of children with disabilities. And uh, this slide uh, lists a few of those experiences. Uh, what's particularly relevant to our discussion today uh, with um, child protection is um, things like they are less likely to have their birth registered, um, to have access to community-based services, and that they're more likely to be in residential institutions, to experience family violence of all kinds, and to experience um, unnecessary family separation. Uh, what's important to, to recognize here is that uh, children with disabilities are first and foremost children. Uh, they have the same right as their peers without disabilities to, um, to everything, including the right to protection and to be protected from all forms of harm. Uh, the difficulty is that they're often facing barriers to, to realizing their rights, um, much as we said in the definition of disability. So barriers might be things like services that are inaccessible or negative beliefs about disability. And those things can lead to discrimination or exclusion. So what, what does this data and these experiences, what does that mean for the social service workforce? Well, we know that there's significant numbers of children with disabilities all around the world. Um, they're affected by, disproportionately affected by protection concerns. So they're definitely in need of support from the social service workforce, but there's barriers affecting, um, affecting their, their uh, participation and their access. So we really need dedicated action to build inclusive and effective child protection systems and um, to have a well-equipped social service workforce that children with disabilities can fully access and benefit from alongside all other children. So for UNICEF, in recognition of this, we have a number of commitments on, on disability inclusive uh, child protection which I'll show briefly on, on this slide. This slide just lists uh, a few of our key strategies, uh, starting with our overarching, the UNICEF strategic plan, uh, goal area three relating to uh, child protection. We also have our disability inclusion policy and strategy, our child protection strategy, and our core commitments for children in humanitarian action. So across these, we have an emphasis on the protection of every child from violence, abuse, uh, neglect, exploitation, and harmful practices, and on supporting inclusive and effective child protection systems, services, and programs. So uh, we at UNICEF, we operationalize these commitments with a specific approach. And this is known as the twin track approach. It is, of course, it's not exclusive to UNICEF. This is a, a very common approach across all um, disability inclusive work. It's known as the twin track approach. And um, it's seen on this slide in a, a diagram showing um, a, a cartoon of people with and without disabilities and arrows uh, combining um, the, bringing the people together. So we have, the first track is including persons with disabilities in mainstream programming, that's known as mainstreaming. And then track two is targeted, so having disability targeted interventions. So the idea is that you're implementing both tracks of programming uh, together at the same time to achieve results. So for um, disability inclusive child protection, there's a number of interventions that, that we can use um, in, in UNICEF and some of those are listed on the slide here. What's most important to the discussion today has been highlighted and that's about enhancing capacities, knowledge and skills of the social service workforce. 
So first we're going to look at the approach to social service workforce strengthening. So on this slide here, we have the cover of a resource that I think will be quite familiar to a lot of people. So it is, of course, uh, the resource that the, um, the Alliance and UNICEF um, uh, co-published and released in 2019, the guidelines to strengthen the social service workforce for child protection. And uh, this slide also shows uh, the full definition of the social service workforce uh, that appears in these guidelines. And to summarize, of course, the workforce is about the range of workers acting across a range of programs to ensure healthy development and well-being of children and families. So um, this, this resource, of course, includes um, the overall strategic framework for, um, for workforce strengthening, which I'll show in the next slide here. And um, this diagram is quite detailed. You can find it in those in the 2019 guidelines. And it shows how um, the, the bottlenecks and the enabling environment factors for um, strengthening the social service workforce, uh, what the key uh, strategic interventions are to address those bottlenecks, uh, the need for multi-sectoral interventions, and how this, um, how this can be used to enable the, uh, the workforce to perform the full range of functions needed for a continuum of, of services. So at this point, it's really important to note that this new resource, the DICP competency framework and the inclusion of children with disabilities more broadly, this fits into to the 2019 guidelines and to this framework. Um, and what is laid out in this diagram, it's, um, it's part of this established approach to, to workforce strengthening. It's not an additional or a separate thing, much as Hugh said in the introduction, um, you know, for, for all um, workforces, you know, uh, we, we want everyone to be equipped to work with all kinds of children um, in all kinds of environment, in all kinds of context, and um, to, to really focus on inclusion of all groups of children. So in, in thinking of inclusion, uh, this slide is just briefly on inclusion being the process of improving the terms for individuals and groups to take part in society. So we are focusing on inclusion of children with disabilities, uh, but this slide does show a list of, of uh, groups of other children um, that are marginalised that are also a consideration when, when we're thinking about um, inclusion. So this is our little introduction done, and now we're going to talk about uh, the framework uh, itself. So this slide shows the cover of the resource, and it also lists the uh, the sections of the resource um, as well. So we've got four parts that we're going to go through, and then we'll go through some more um, detailed examples of how we can use the resource. So uh, the introduction, part one, gives background, establishes the basic knowledge, a little bit like what we just went through in this presentation. Uh, on this slide, we've got um, a couple of key definitions of child protection functions, the activities performed in delivering the services, competencies, the skills, knowledge, and abilities needed to perform those functions. Um, we also have a bit on why a framework, uh, because this is something that has come up. So, uh, we have been asked, you know, why did we decide to do a framework rather than a training module or something more prescriptive? I'm sure as many of you would know, um, the child protection systems, you know, and the workforce exist in incredibly diverse contexts, um, geopolitical, socioeconomic, legislative, cultural, and it's, it's incredibly difficult to try and uh, develop um, a, a training module or something like that that's really globally relevant and standardized and there's already so many training or prescript really prescriptive resources that are designed for those very um you know very diverse contexts so instead we wanted something that could really flexibly be used across um, different environments so it focus we're focusing on the commonalities across the social service workforce uh, which are the child protection functions and the associated competencies needed to perform those functions in disability inclusive ways. 
So we like to imagine the competency framework as being made up of bricks. You can use the individual bricks and add them to what you're building, or you can take a few as they are already. So part two of the resource is the core competencies. So the foundation knowledge and skills that are integral to an inclusive and effective child protection system. And so should be held by all of the workers. So the first table is general social service work core competencies. And that's what we see on the slide here. Um, this, this particular table shows um, core competencies related to values. So it shows the sub areas and then it has a description um, of those values. The second table uh, in this section is for disability core competencies. It focuses specifically on knowledge because the feedback from colleagues and partners is um, that people often felt like they didn't have the, the knowledge about disability and engaging with children with disabilities. So, so that was the reason for the focus on knowledge there. Um, so we go through things like what inclusion means, what participation means. There's also a more detailed um, intermediate disability knowledge in the annexes. Now, part three of the resource is the main part. It's the really expansive tables exploring the functional competencies required for disability inclusion. And the tables are arranged by the type of child protection functions as listed on the slide here, promotive functions, preventive functions, and response functions. There's over 40 functions across these tables. Um, the reason there's so many is that you know, we're trying to, to get as many as possible uh, because, you know, there are so many uh, functions to help meet different goals for different stakeholders at different times in different contexts. And, you know, workers might perform many of these functions, some of these functions from different categories, from multiple categories. Um, at the same time, this certainly isn't um, an exhaustive or complete list, uh, but we did try to cover as many as possible. And when, when using this resource, of course, we want to keep in mind that it's relevant to, to all kinds of social service workers across many contexts and scenarios. So not just for workers um, specifically engaging with children with disabilities or services just for children with disabilities. Um, you know, as, as you were saying in the introduction, these are uh, functions that, that um, the social service workforce are already performing. These aren't, um, you know, new and different uh, functions. And many workers will already hold some of these competencies in full or in part. We're really trying to show with this framework how disability inclusion can be integrated into the competencies that the workers already hold and how to build competencies that are disability inclusive from the start. So we're going to see what these tables look like in the resource. So this slide shows part of one of those tables. So um, the header columns from left to right, it has the function, the actions to perform the function, the skills and the knowledge. So the functions in the tables are grouped together just to make it easier to navigate because there's quite a few. Uh, so this one has been labeled enabling environment. Um, and so functions will be things like, in this example, it's implementing policies of the ministry. Actions are the practical steps to be taken. We included these, again, due to feedback um, that people would like to know how to actually implement disability inclusion. So things like what to analyze, what to assess, what to do. The skills, um, so the abilities, the capacities, and then the knowledge is the information and understanding that's needed. Now, finally, part four of the resource is the annexes. This slide lists what those are in the annexes. So we've got examples of how to use, which are the, um, which is what it will go into next. Then we have the intermediate disability knowledge competencies and a list of internal and external resources. So this slide here just has an overview of some general examples of use uh, for the resource. And this is just some examples. Again, uh, we can, we'll go through some in a bit more detail, but uh, some of the 
the ways that we imagine people using this resource include job descriptions, training modules, self-assessment tool, developing policies and procedures. So our, we're going to go through six examples. So uh, these aren't meant to be like mandatory or prescriptive things, really just to demonstrate the, um, the range of potential uses. So our first example is based on mapping a country's social service workforce for child protection. So the slide shows um, at the bottom an, an excerpt of a table created for mapping. And at the top, it's a step-by-step -step process of mapping a child protection workforce, asking the questions first, what child protection functions are currently being performed? Second, who is performing these functions currently? And third, what competencies do they hold? So mapping is is a really you know helpful activity alongside the using the competency framework because it really helps in identifying the overlaps in functions amongst workers and agencies, which can be really difficult to assess from only job title or agency. So moving on to the second slide for this example. This slide shows more of our sample table of, of the workforce mapping. And the, um, the table of the mapping has uh, the headings of um, the agency type of management, worker mandate, worker type, worker function type. And then different colors have been used to uh, circle and highlight the workers performing similar types of functions, so to identify. So we have, uh, for example, we've got promotive functions um, highlighted in green, and then we've got prevent workers who perform mostly preventive functions, mostly response functions, workers who perform a mix of functions. Also have highlighted workers um, who are professional, who are paraprofessional, and who are community-based volunteer. So this exercise is, is helpful because it shows that these workers are at different types of um, services with different titles, but there's similarities in, in their functions and in the type of work that they are performing. And so in this example, the, you know, the full mapping would reveal their full list of functions and it would help in deciding um, you know, what, what it is that they need to be doing to, to carry out those functions in a disability inclusive way. So let's look at how we use the mapping and the framework together. So uh, this, this example is, shows a, a few, different, um, few different options for what to do with the information that we've collected from the mapping. So on the far left, uh, the next step in our process is, is the question, is disability inclusion within the competencies that the workers hold? So the first path we might take is at the top of the slide, we could identify the actions for disability inclusion relevant to their functions. And then we could de develop a disability inclusion action plan to enhance inclusion and accessibility. Another path we could take once we did the mapping is that we could identify the disability inclusion competencies needed for these workers' functions. And then we could create a capacity building plan for developing the needed competencies or we could develop a disability inclusive job description for future recruitment. And then the third option we have here is that we could identify the knowledge for disability inclusion needed, and then we could host a workshop on disability inclusion. This slide shows the full process um, of using the mapping and the um, competency framework together, showing all of the step-by-step -step actions together and how you could use them um, in different ways. Our next example is about creating a disability inclusive job description. Uh, this one is a paraprofessional working in a child protection service. It's a community engagement officer and it's not specifically related, it's not specifically about working with children with disabilities, but using the competency framework enables it to be a disability sensitive and informed job description. 
So the job description is in a table. On the left, it has the job tasks, required knowledge and required skills. And then on the right, it has um, the full description. The, the slide also has some excerpts taken from the competency framework. And what we have used to create the job tasks is the function on um, community awareness, which has come from the promotive function table. And then the, um, fun the uh, corresponding points from that function on knowledge and on skills. And there are arrows from the excerpts showing exactly where that text appears in the job description. We didn't use every single point because some weren't relevant to the context. Some points were copied directly, some were adapted to add more information. It really just demonstrates how you can use the most relevant parts of the competency framework to make, um, to make something that's suited to your context. This next example is a disability inclusion action plan. So this would be um, for strengthening disability inclusion within a child protection team. So on this slide, um, we see just the part of the action plan for um, a child protection manager, but the full example, which appears in the annex, has um, other staff members. So to develop this uh, action plan, first, the list of functions performed by each worker was drawn from a review of their job descriptions and from information provided by each worker on any additional tasks or responsibilities they had um, that perhaps weren't in their job descriptions. Then the list of functions was compared to the DICP competency framework to identify the closest match. And then a selection of relative actions um, were assigned to the different workers to create this action plan. So similar actions were actually assigned to multiple workers across the team, but then um, different levels of responsibility um, were assigned to um, different uh, workers. So higher levels of responsibility for more senior workers. So in this example here, the um, first two actions in the plan have been highlighted and there's an arrow to an excerpt from, um, the, uh, from the competency framework showing that um, those, those two actions came from a preventive function that was about working with communities and other services. And then um, the, the next two actions came from a um, promotive function related to enabling environment. And then the same for the, for the next three came from another, um, another function related to enabling environment as well. So it's pulled from across a range of different uh, functions for this particular worker. Our next example is a capacity development plan. So this, this sample is um, designed for social service workers performing child protection preventive functions in a local community. This full example appears in the annex of the resource. In this example, we have two levels of workers, professionals and paraprofessionals. And in this example, the, the social service manager would use this to discuss with their workers what capacities they want to develop to, um, you know, so that the workers feel equipped to perform their work in a disability inclusive way. So for, for the workers, they might already have some of the knowledge and skills, but then perhaps for some of the others, they, they feel they need to develop those. So training and support can be developed um, and planned in accordance with, with this. So the slide shows how this plan was developed. At the top, we have an excerpt from the preventive functions table of the competency framework. And then at the bottom, we have part of the capacity development plan. So to do this first, we had uh, the functions performed by the workers were identified within the competency framework. And on the slide, we have um, the, the box and arrows to, to indicate that the um, function on early detection mechanisms was pulled from the framework and put into our comp uh, capacity development plan. And then the corresponding 
skills and knowledge areas were pulled from the framework and put into the plan as well. So important to note here that again, these um, the, the things pulled from the framework have been adapted to fit the type of worker. So for the paraprofessional workers, uh, we have asked for basic level competency and then for the um, professional workers asked for an in-depth or advanced level competency. So demonstrating how the workers are performing the same basic function and need similar competencies just at a slightly different level. To build on this example, our next, um, our next example would be sample training workshop agendas for these workers. So on the left of this slide, we have just uh, the capacity development plan for our paraprofessional social service workers. And then on the right, we have a sample agenda for um, a training workshop for disability targeted um, training. So recalling our twin track approach that we talked about earlier. So this is the disability targeted work. So the agenda was created by looking at the competencies um, listed in in the uh, capacity development plan and pulling out the points on knowledge to use as agenda items. So on the slide, we've used arrows to indicate the direct connection. So in the plan, basic knowledge of disability has been has turned into the agenda item introduction to disability. And then the details of what to be covered under each agenda item comes from information within the framework, especially that um, table on the core disability knowledge competencies and on the intermediate disability knowledge competencies that appears in the annex, as well as locally relevant information um, like a situation analysis and the content of the training, again, can be um, you know, developed from the resources within the framework, but also um, the, the resources that are listed in the annexes, as well as the um, locally relevant knowledge again, and expertise. So your colleagues, your partners, and support from, from um, you know, local, local partners as well. Our next example shows a disability mainstreamed workshop. So twin track approach, this is the mainstreamed example. So once again, we have the capacity development plan example on the left of the slide, and we have the agenda on the right. Same approach, we've used the knowledge items to create the agenda items in the workshop. So this, um, so for example, we've got the knowledge item on familiarity with community issues has become the agenda item on introduction to the community. So this example really shows how you could take an existing training workshop and revise it to mainstream consideration of children with disabilities rather than having like a separate or additional training. So you could um, integrate the disability um, inclusion aspects in there. Now, our final example is about building individual knowledge on disability inclusive child protection. So this is great for, for anyone who just wants to improve their personal expertise on the topic. Uh, some of the, the concepts in the framework might be you know, unfamiliar um, to some users. So we've tried to make it easy to find the um, explanatory information. So this slide shows part of um, one of the um, tables on, on promotive functions. The uh, word accessibility or accessible has been uh, circled a few times because it comes up quite frequently. And then on the next slide, we have excerpts from different parts of the competency framework, showing the different um, parts that, of the resource you could go to, to learn more about accessibility. So you could go to the disability core competencies in part two, you could go to the annexes, to um, the intermediate knowledge competencies, and to the um, UNICEF resources to learn more about accessibility. So a lot of ways to, to learn more there. So that brings us to the end of those examples. And we're now going to get into question and discussion time. So I think I'm going to pass to, um, I think Annie and Elena will um, start our question and discussion time. Yeah. <clears throat> 
sure i can kick it off i mean there are lots of interesting questions that are actually coming up in q and a and i tried my best to answer some of those but i think lucy it will be good to hear some of your reflections on uh, these questions because uh, you know there are questions about you know what is disability inclusion do we have a definition of disability inclusion uh, that that i thought was quite an interesting question because you know disability inclusion is a process uh, which has not been really defined as just those two words but really for example in unicef we have the disability inclusion strategy and action plan so could you speak a little bit to the disability inclusion strategy and action plan and how it articulates the work around disability inclusion when it comes to children i've already posted the link to the disability inclusion action plan and strategy over to you great thank you so much yeah that's a it's a great question. So um, yeah, so really, when we when we talk about um, disability inclusion, and um, you know, I, I briefly touched on on you know inclusion uh, as a concept, and it's it's really about uh, making sure that uh, children with disabilities have the the same opportunity as everyone else to participate in society on an equal basis with others. So with uh, UNICEF's disability inclusion uh, policy and strategy, uh, what we want to have is, is a, um, we want children with disabilities to be able to, to access and participate in their communities and in services and systems on an equal basis uh, with other children. Uh, we want them to have, um, you know, access to the same resources, the same environments, the same uh, community-based services, um, and the same, um, you know, really just the same opportunities as, as all other children. And really for, you know, it is about, it is, as, as you just said, you know, it is a, a process. Um, there's, there's not, um, you know, it's, it can be like really quite um, progressive, you know, it can start, it can start quite small and, and start to build up. And there's, there's really a lot of different ways um, to do uh, to do inclusion and to approach inclusion and um, it's it's really also about the um, participation and empowerment of of children and they're also about enabling their independence and their ability to um, to choose things uh, for themselves and respect their evolving capacities the same way that uh, we respect the evolving uh, capacities of of other children um, and really that we want to to change the environments so that they are inclusive uh, that they're barrier free and that they're um, supportive and enabling environments uh, for everyone including children with disabilities and I think, yeah, it's really helpful to have a look at our disability inclusion policy and strategy, as well as the um, the overall United Nations disability inclusion strategy is really helpful for that as well. Thank you, Lucy. I'll give you a minute's breather and respond to one of the questions that is there. Uh, very interesting question from Freddie about, you know, what is the required qualification for professional social service workers as well as paraprofessionals? It's a really interesting question, and I find it very interesting because uh, in several countries, there have been steps that have been taken to really uh, articulate what is required qualification for different kinds of workers and that is something that is relatively new actually it, it's a recent development in the last i would say last five or ten years that countries have started articulating that if you are going to work with this set of people then you need to have this level of qualification or if you are going to perform certain level of tasks then you need to have certain qualifications. For example, you're increasingly seeing uh, social workers, whether it's a master's in social work or a bachelor's in social work as a required qualification. 
yeah for para professionals for example they are required to have certificates after a high school uh, graduation where you are specifically certified to work as a para professional or as a community organizer to uh, provide services or work in the community on various social services but a lot of that is done in a in a very very decentralized manner at the national and sub national level depending on the situation depending on the cultural context and i also think that both professionals and para professionals have very specific skills and knowledge that they require so even if you are even if we assume that professionals are somehow higher than para professionals it's important for all of us to keep in mind that the skill set required is so diverse that even if you have a masters or a post graduate certificate you may not be able to perform certain tasks that a para professional can do based on their skills that are required so it's not so much about the hierarchy of the profession but really about the skills and the functions uh, the the skills that are required to perform those functions so at the national level those are continuously being <clears throat> defined and uh, articulated a little bit more now through national legislation and through social work and social social uh, social welfare programs so to speak so just wanted to reflect on that <clears throat> and uh, lucy if i come back to you there is a question about the challenges in developing and implementing these frameworks so uh, based on your uh, you know analysis and the literature that we have reviewed so far what do you think are some of the key challenges to uh, implementing or design a framework at the national level like you know we have this resource now which is at a global level to translate that on the ground what do you imagine to be some of the key challenges thank you great great thanks any so that's a great question and i think you know really broadly speaking i think one of the uh, major challenges is that it's it often is is thought of as being um you know disability inclusion is often thought of as being this very um resource intensive, um, very time consuming, very overwhelming and, um, you know, needing a lot of expertise and, you know, very difficult thing to implement. And <clears throat> it really doesn't, it really doesn't um, have to be. Um, it's, we can, we can think about progressive realization. Um, everybody has to start somewhere. Um, and, you know, starting with small changes can start to build up into bigger changes. So I think one of the important things is to to make, um, you know, really to think about the kind of, you know, attitudes and the way that we're like approaching it and thinking about it. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, very expensive or very time consuming or anything like that. So that's, that's uh, one point about it. And I think also, um, you know, thinking about how, um, you know, having, using um, this resource and this kind of approach, uh, thinking about integrating it into um, work that is already ongoing is, is really important. So rather than um, looking at this as being uh, something you know, separate um, and having it siloed and separate to really try and um, integrate this into <clears throat> ongoing um, social service workforce strengthening into broader child protection system strengthening to really look at it as a part of that work rather than something separate, um, you know, to to really see it as, as really building on on the efforts that are already ongoing. And I think also um, coordinating with, um, with other uh, stakeholders and actors uh, in the space that work with children with disabilities or families um, of children with disabilities. So for example, organizations of persons with disabilities, um, at the perhaps at the local level or the national level can can offer um, support and engagement um, on you know uh, connecting with with groups 
uh, sorry, connecting with uh, children with disabilities and their families and on understanding more about the local context or the national context uh, to make sure that whatever plans and frameworks um, you're working towards, that it's appropriate uh, for, for that context. Um, so, so yeah, I think really to, to, to try and look at it in, in that sense and, um, you know, to, to look at different ways to, to integrate it into, into your work. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. And I think we have time for one more question. In fact, uh, there are a couple of questions that are really uh, around integration, which you just uh, spoke to. And maybe <clears throat> if you could just uh, give us uh, a little bit more about the examples that you provided in terms of how do you uh, create new training programs or adapt existing training programs, because I'm seeing a couple of questions here, which are about, you know, how do you integrate disability inclusion in programming where we don't have a professional who specializes in disability inclusion? So how do you do that? Similarly, you already have child protection workforce, for example. There is social service workforce that works on child protection, but they really don't have the skills on disability inclusion. And you did provide, you did touch on those couple of examples in terms of new curriculum or adapting existing curriculum. So if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, and uh, so that you know, we can we can see how it can be done more practically. Thanks. Great, thank you. So yes, so that's um, that's definitely a really uh, important question, and um, I I would like to f firstly draw attention to um, a, another forthcoming resource that UNICEF has, which is the uh, disability inclusion training for frontline workers. So this is coming from um, our main disability team here at UNICEF headquarters. And it's a series of uh, video training with, um, it has like a associated like learning brief written material as well. And it's for all workers who, who do face-to-face -face work with um, community members. So it's, it's almost, it's been tested in different countries. It's almost ready to be uh, released, but it will be available on the UNICEF website. Uh, so that's, um, that's an example of, of one of the resources that's coming out. Um, so I mentioned that because I think it, it can be really difficult if you don't have a, like a disability inclusion um, expert or, or someone to, to help you with that in, in your workplace or in uh, where, you're, where you're located. So I would, would encourage um, using what resources are available, such as this, you know, the frontline workers uh, package that, that we have coming out, but also uh, looking at your, your local partners. So I mentioned organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, when you see the, the competency framework resource, you'll see some information about organizations like that. Uh, to, so to try and get, um, if you don't have, you know, your in-house kind of experts, try and get, um, um, try and look, you know, at your uh, local partners, try and look at the, um, like at the national level or at the global level, um, like, like UNICEF, um, look for uh, existing resources that might, um, might fit your scenario and see how it can fit into to the work that you're doing. I, um, it can be very, yeah, it can be very difficult when you don't have, um, you know, you don't have that already on hand, but yeah, I would really encourage you to, to look at the resources that are available and, uh, see how it can be, um, integrated and yeah, also to really, yeah, take advantage of, of what's already out there and, um, yeah, use it however, uh, you can. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, for the for the responses. And once again, thank you for the fantastic presentation and overview of the framework itself. Uh, we are almost there, uh, we, about five minutes left. So without other further ado, I would like to hand it to Kirsten D. Martino, UNICEF Senior Advisor on Child Protection, uh, to give us some reflections and concluding remarks. Kirsten, over to you. Thank you so much, Annie, <clears throat> and thank you so much, Lucy. 
apologies for the croaky voice. I'm recovering from, from a little cold, so I will do my best to speak as clearly as possible. But I see so many hands clapping. So, so congratulations, Lucy, obviously, and hearts even. Uh, so obviously a lot of enthusiasm around this new resource and, and really want to thank everybody for joining this uh, webinar today. I'm really very excited that we are launching this new resource today with the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. Um, as we were developing this uh, resource with Lucy and Annie and other colleagues, colleagues in our disability team here at UNICEF headquarters and with colleagues in the field as well. I was saying, gosh, I wish I had had this resource 20 years ago when I first started working in child protection and with children with disabilities. I was working at the time in um, um, in Moldova in particular, and we were trying to prevent children from being placed in institutions or trying to get children who were already in institutions with severe disabilities to be to be taken out of those settings. And we started to establish what was then what were then called sort of community centers for children with disabilities to try to um, you know, ensure that these children could grow up in the community with their families. And we looked for so many resources and we really couldn't find anything to train uh, the people and the staff working in these community centers. Everything was very much based on sort of the medical training, the therapeutic training of children with disabilities. But there really wasn't anything for the social service workforce at the time to enable them to work in a more inclusive manner with, with um, these children and families. So super excited that this has now been developed and launched today. Uh, as we've heard from the previous speakers, really the social service workforce is our priority in child protection. It is at the heart of everything we do to working with children and families at community level. And it's definitely at the heart of our child protection programming in UNICEF. It's firmly embedded as a priority. Uh, building the capacity of this workforce is a priority in our child protection strategy globally for UNICEF and in our current strategic uh, plan. We all know how absolutely critical the social service workforce um, is to our work and how important it is that they have the right competencies, the right skill set to firstly do no harm. I think that's the first line. It's actually that they intervene in a way that does no harm to children and families. Secondly, that they do not discriminate against any group of children, including children with disabilities, and that they actually have the skills to protect and support children with uh, disabilities in an equitable manner. They also have to have the skills to support children, families, and communities in their whole, in the whole inclusive child um, environment to prevent and protect them from, for example, family separation and placement in institutions, as I said before, but also to protect them from violence, neglect, abuse, and so forth. They really have to have enabling skills, so to say, that help families and children to, to be more resilient uh, in whatever context they may be working in, from the development context to the humanitarian context in high or low capacity contexts. <clears throat> so this new resource, this disability inclusive child protection uh, competency framework um, has really all the elements, everything that the social service workforce may use in different ways in a flexible, adaptive manner in their local context and country typology. So we didn't want to necessarily have a pre-made pre ready training package that then can be, a, that everybody can use, that isn't flexible, that isn't adaptable to the realities of each context and each country. And this is what the, the competency framework really, really does. So they also, Lucy also talked about the many varied possibilities there are for using this competency framework at the country level. It can be used for mapping the social service workforce. It can be used for developing job description, for developing action plans, for many, many diverse uh, needs that you may have on the ground. 
but certainly we always want to continue learning from you. We would love to hear back from you if you apply the competency framework, how you have used it and, and learn from you. So we can also share those important learnings with other colleagues across the globe. And also, as Lucy mentioned, we do have other resources available that you can uh, also use to complement this competency framework. We have a disability inclusive child protection system strengthening uh, um, tool. We have a disability inclusive training uh, um, resource for frontline workers. And we are also developing and we have about to release a migrant inclusive child protection system strengthening uh, resource. So all these resources, of course, complement uh, this particular resource that we have shared today. All these resources are available online. And of course, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, to reach out to Lucy, Annie, our colleagues for any further information, clarification you need, or even support as you uh, use and apply and hopefully roll out this competency framework in your country. And last but not least, I really wanted to thank the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance today for for um, organizing this, this webinar with us. And uh, last but not least, all the participants who have joined us today, and in particular, also my colleagues, Annie and Lucy, for the fantastic work they continue to do on ensuring that all children, including children with disabilities, are included and can participate equally in society. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.